What's up guys, welcome to this episode of Beers and Breakdowns. We're back again. You know what, just in the intro, I'm just gonna say it out loud. What are we talking about? Hey, before, so we don't have to put a commercial into this. Can we just talk about the things that we have going on real quick? Yeah. We got the mentor program rocket. It's legit. You have three tiers. Tier one is one-on-one -on -one coaching with the Green Beret. You're never gonna get better coaching. Tier two is group session in small groups. So it's amazing. And then tier three is video only. So if you guys wanna support this channel, you like what we're doing and you want it to continue, please consider signing up for at least the tier three because that is purely just to support us and get exclusive content that we upload weekly. All right, guys, in this video, we're gonna check out Bravo 2-0. Have you heard of this one? I've not. So this movie was made in 1999, but the dude's still around under the, the pseudonym? Pseudonym. Pseudonym, it's a fucking ridiculous word. Pseudonym, Chris Ryan. So Chris Ryan was an SAS member and they went on a mission and it went to complete shit. Uh, Chris Ryan is still, Chris Ryan is still around and talking on podcasts. He's been on podcasts recently. I didn't listen to it. I don't got time to be listening to a, a ton of podcasts about war shit. I'd rather, like no offense, but I'd rather listen to like motivational stuff mm -hmm. because I, we got, we got to keep moving. So, yeah. but he's still around. He's still talking about stuff and we're going to review this movie. Disclaimer. I think that this movie was exaggerated quite a bit. And I felt watching it, I was like, this is badass, right? So this is the conundrum that we face and it's hard to review real events because you have something that actually happened. And this dude, without a doubt, all these guys are badasses. Mm -hmm. They're fucking SAS, tier one unit. They're badass. There's no fucking doubt. So you don't want to disrespect them by like calling things out. But when I watch this, I'm like, uh, there's a few things that I'm like, uh. So I looked it up and according to the survivors of this event, there are some contradictions and there's part of the survivors that are calling out the others saying that they exaggerated, like the teeth pulling during captivity um, and like going up against like tanks. It, there's some things that obviously seemed like they're a bit oversold, but Let's watch the movie. We'll break it down. And again, we don't want to disrespect people who did badass stuff, but we're here to break down the movie. And to me, some of this movie gets a little far-fetched. Oh, and one of you guys asked, because we stopped doing it, we stopped introducing the beers that we're drinking, because Abel's not drinking. I don't know if you guys know that right now, but Abel is on a no drinking hiatus. And the reason for that is because he is trying to pass Special Forces selection PT test. I don't know why that took me so long to think PT of. PT test. But he's trying to he's trying to pass the the PT test, which is not special forces specific, but then also the pull ups. He wants to be in SF shape. He wants to be in Green Beret shape. SF fit is what we're calling it. And to do that, this heavy calorie amazingness has got to go out of his life for a while. So, damn, this shit's old as fuck. All right, bro. Time out. Time out. That's some dumb and dumber shit. Was that two guys? Yeah, that's two dudes <laughs> on a Harley. Like, listen, I don't care what mission we get called up from. I don't care how dope that shit is. Like, we could be going after the number one fucking most wanted dude in the world. I am not getting on the back of a Harley with another man. I don't care how chauvinistic you think that sounds. I will fucking walk. Don't be so suburban. What do you mean? It's a new age. We can do things like that. You could do whatever the fuck you want. I will never get on the back of another man's Harley. Ever. All right. How would you? If I rolled up in my Harley, <laughs> would you get on the back? No, I'm not getting on the back. Why, you chauvinistic pig? What do you have? Uh, what is it called when you have, you're too macho? Are you too manly? It's not the man thing. I just don't like being on a motorcycle. Oh, so you're not getting on a motorcycle, period. Period, yeah. Like I, I've, I had a Road King, a 2005 Road King, a beautiful bike. I got rid of it once I became a cop because, well, seeing people with their limbs hanging around, I was like, nah. So I love Harleys, but 
it's just a Harley thing that you just you just don't get on the back of another man's bike. I've been looking into um, Gonzo. So uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Uh huh. What's his name? Hunter S. Thompson. Hunter S. Thompson. I just ordered his book on Hell's Angels. Did you watch that interview? He was defi- so the whole the way that the Hunter S. Thompson's book with Hell's Angels ended is he stuck up for a a, a female who was getting beat by her husband. Mm-hmm. And so he's like, hey, stop beating her. Only, you know, only punks beat their wives. And the dude, they start whooping his ass. And then he started getting kicked in the head and shit. So he went on a talk show. And Hunter S. Thompson uh, is doing an interview. And a Harley guy rides in, a uh, Hell's Angel, and says, sometimes, he goes, you didn't mind your own business. That's why you got your ass beat. He goes, sometimes, you know, women are like rugs. You got to beat them to keep them in line. And the whole crowd started going, yep, ha, 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 yep. And women, everyone was like agreeing with him. So Hunter S. Thompson is sitting there being fucking demoralized and treated like a piece of shit for sticking up for a woman getting beat by her husband. That's fucking insane. When did that happen? Dude, it was like, I don't know the year of the, the video, but you can watch it on YouTube. The Hell's Angel rode in on his Harley and was like. I don't understand. Like, did they have him there? They contacted him and let him know yeah. that he would be there. Yeah. Was, wow. Yeah. It's fucking, so they set the whole... The whole weird. They, yeah, you guys watch that video. It's insane how times have changed. Situation. The Scouts landing in Israel are causing the Alliance major problems. Mission. In two parts. One, locate and destroy the fiber optic cable running along the northern MSR. Two, destroy mobile scout. Repeat. One, locate and destroy the fiber optic cable which runs along the northern MSR. To destroy mobile scope. Any questions? This was an important scene because it breaks down their mission. And they, so, so one was to destroy the cable that runs, the, destroy the cable that runs along the MSR uh-huh. that programs the Scud missiles, and then two to destroy the mobile Scud missile launcher. Okay, itself. Yeah. So their plan was obviously it's just to go find that cable which is obviously is going to be dug into the ground Uh and dig it up and then they would have to you know plant some explosives on that cable blow it and then he was like well they're just going to come fix it and he goes yeah if you could take them out too then so it's this it's this whole operation to just cut a cable so if you listen to pseudonym chris ryan's kind of like quick explanation on it is they had maps that were way outdated. Mm-hmm. So they didn't have any like updated locations on it. So they're already at a disadvantage. They didn't have any equipment because they didn't plan on actually doing operations. Mm-hmm. So they're literally like last minute trying to find the equipment to do this operation. They're trying to, f- they're tr- like beg borrowing and stealing everything they need just to go on this operation that they didn't think they were going to have to do within like days Hmm. so it's literally like and this is one of the problems with special operations is that they're such talented people that we put too much on them Hmm. we're just like ah send them they're tier one they're you know tier two they could do it right and it's like we're never special operations guys are never going to say no to a mission but no matter how difficult it is, but there's a, a point where it's like, all right, you're just asking too much. Yeah. And this is a prime example of that. And this is, you know, from the two seconds of research that I did on this, Chris Ryan was like, this thing was doomed from the start. We just didn't have the intel. We didn't have uh, the um, equipment that we needed. And it was basically a shit show from the very onset. Mm. And he and that's one thing that he said about SAS and what makes him so good and any special operations what makes him so good is that we learn from our mistakes, we figure out what we did wrong and then we fix it and we don't forget history so that way we don't repeat our mistakes. <laughs> what? Just the look on his face while he's about to launch that. It's like he's picking up a sandwich. He's off. <laughs> Kids divided equally, so if anything goes wrong, any two of us can carry out the task with some success. We only took the essentials, but even that added up to 209 pounds each, the weight of a 15 stone man. So they're carrying 200 pounds? That's what he says, that they're each carrying 209 pounds. On their backs? Yeah. 
Is that even possible? I I call bullshit on that. I 100% call bullshit. In selection, we carried up to 130 pounds. And it was so hard just to fit that much weight and density into the ruck itself. Right. It was like exploding out of the seams. And you are damn near mission incapable at 120. I would say 100, anywhere past 100 pounds, especially up to 140 pounds on your back. You, it's so hard to like walk any distance. Your hip flexors are like wanting to give out. Your knees are fucked. You can't move like terrain. If there's any terrain, forget about it. You're just destroying like at least every team has like a weakest guy, a weak link, right? Right. And like 209 pounds? Are you fucking high? I mean, I could see if there's a freak athlete that can do that for a short amount of time right. as like an event or as some sort of a record. But for somebody to say, I'm just going to put that on my back and then go and complete a mission for days on end is insane. It's, it's It doesn't seem reasonable. Ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I don't. And maybe it's true, but gosh dang, man, if I don't believe it for a second, first of all, but second of all, if you were leading this mission and you said, yeah, we need 209 pounds on our backs and we're going to make this work, like that was a stupid decision. That's like me getting on your back right now and then you going and doing a mission with me strapped to your back the whole time. There, yeah, there's no way. And I don't like talking shit, especially about real world operations, about guys that were clearly way more badass than me, but 209 fucking pounds? Put that on for a second. And all you guys that are sitting there thinking, yeah, I could do it, I could do it. Yeah, fuck you can. Go put on 209 pounds, go find someone that's 209 pounds near you, throw that motherfucker on your back and go for a walk. And let me see how far you get just doing and that's with someone like legs wrapped around you and like holding on like a blanket yeah. you're throwing that shit in a rucksack and you have to have your your weapon system on top of it and think about your mission 209 pounds this is where this movie was like mm, i don't fucking think so at the at the very least as a leader of an operation if i had a bunch of guys and our minimum supply to make this operation successful was 200 pounds, I'd be like, listen, something has to change because I'm not gonna put my guys out there with 200 pounds on the back. I don't care how tough they are, there's humans have limitations. Mm -hmm. And that is fucking bananas. So there, there's a world record for uh, the a marathon with 100 pounds and that guy is fucking bananas. And I've talked to him, he's a great dude because I'm, I'm gonna try to break that record. And he's helping me try to break that record. Still gonna do it? Yeah, I have to. Like, right. and it's gonna take. But it takes. He trained for like a year and a half, uh -huh. and that's a hundred pounds for twenty six miles. And it, and it was like he like lost an inch of height because his spine compressed so much in that oh one my day. God. Yeah, dude, it's not good. Two hundred pounds. Mm. Anyway, we'll leave it at that. I think we. You're gonna get shorter. Huh? You're gonna get shorter? Fuck you, dude. It comes back. Oh, okay. You could decompress, like, I hope. Like a spring? Yeah, I hope <laughs> fucking hope so. Days on him. Yeah. Oh shit, I roll it. It's alright for you. We've gotta come back this way. <laughs> So they got locked on with a missile, and then he was just banking the shit out of it, trying not to get hit. Oh, okay. So they're all just waiting to die, basically. Uh, but that would just suck. Anyway. Yeah, I imagine it sucks because you can't do anything about it. From Nothing sitting you can in do. The back. Oof. Got to in those positions, Chris. That's a huge issue already. And so this is where the map issue comes in is because they get dropped off and they're supposed to be in a remote location and they're supposed to move. And this is another thing. I think they said they're supposed to move 20 clicks. Uh-huh. 20 clicks with 200 pounds in your back? Yeah. Okay. They're supposed to have a long movement uh, and then they get dropped off and they're like right on top of the Scud missile. So the Scud missile launches and they're like right fucking there. Mm. So this whole, they're they're basically in 
like behind enemy lines in the worst situation possible from the get-go right. because the intel wasn't updated enough for them to know that they're getting themselves in a, that the, their drop-off point was a bad location so they got dropped off in a shit storm no it's a dog good news is i've located that one <laughs> Uh, okay, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I understand that you guys get comfortable around each other, like in the room and stuff, and if yeah. you guys have to shit in front of each other, you guys have to do all that. But on mission, he's like behind him holding a little fucking bowl. This guy's taking it's his a shit. Bag, yeah. It's a bag? Yeah. Is it only because they're planning on doing something with the bag? No. But why didn't he why doesn't he just shit in the ground? So there's a lot of reasons for that. So behind enemy lines, you don't want to leave any trace. Mm. And so if you start shitting all over the floor, first of all, someone's going to smell that. And second of all, it's a sign that you have been there. So there literally needs to be no trace of their existence. So they shit in the bag, they take it with them. Everything they pack in, they pack out. So the whole idea of shitting in the bag and collecting your shit is so that there's no sign that you were ever there. Because think about this. So they camp for like a couple days. And let's say they just set up camp. They start a fire. Uh, they're cooking their meals. They're shitting in holes. And they're comfortable, right? Yeah. So then they push out to go to a different location. And now the enemy comes up. It's going to be so obvious that there's soldiers there watching them. There's shit on the floors. There's a uh, shit hole tr trench dug. There's a campfire, Doug, you know, like, yeah. So there has to be zero sign of life. So that way when they move out and somebody comes into that little valley that they're in, they wipe their footprints away with, um, uh, like a branches and shit. You like, they clean up completely. So it looks like zero signs of life. No, I totally get that. Yeah. And that all that makes sense. It's just the way that that scene plays out is, is just hilarious and weird. Because if you think about, it, like, if you have to shit, if you got diarrhea and you're shitting or whatever, and, like, you have to hold the bag and you're going to shit on yourself, like, if you're like, dude, please hold this for me. Like, I'll hold it for you. I'll hold it for you so you don't shit all over yourself because... Well, I understand. I don't have a problem with that. Yeah. I mean, so would I. If the situation is what it is, you just get used to it anyway. But yeah, I'm just saying, watching the movie in itself is, is pretty interesting. I'm gonna go. Itchy. It had to be Ray. Hello, Captain. If it had been anyone else, Tony or Stan, he might have taught the kid down. His own kids might love him, but he'd never get a job playing Santa Claus. Lovely piece of chocolate, yeah? So this is another kind of like big issue I have with this movie is based on what I researched after was like they kind of sold this dude out and said that essentially it was his fault for not taking out the kid for not taking out the kid. And I'm not saying they had to kill him, but I, I, I would hope that. But hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Like, it's easy to look back at a situation and be like, that was the pivotal moment. Mm -hmm. But in the moment, he was he he was trying to, like, entice the kid with chocolate, make him his friend. So, like, maybe he was going to grab him once he got the chocolate. But it's the same thing as, like, Lone Survivor. Like, it's easy to look back and be like, shouldn't let that guy go. Yeah. But it's like, you didn't fucking know that that guy was going to take off, like, Usain Bolt down the fucking mountain and then, you know, alert the enemy to your position. All right. Right? So it's like hindsight, fucking blast him in the face, you know. But they tried, I guess, that they like made it look like this guy's fault for everything that happens next. Okay. Because he didn't like grab the kid and rip him down. And then even in the movie, they hint to that when he, I mean, he narrates if it was anyone else, they would have grabbed the kid. But his kids may love him. But, you know, he ain't won winning any awards for. Santa Claus. But my issue is the fact that he ended up passing away and then you still came out and kind of like dissed him. Right. It's like he's a fallen fucking soldier. He's your he's your homie, he's your boy, he's a comrade. Like and you're gonna diss him 
after he got killed? Ugh. I hope that's not true. I hope that was just like some shit I looked up, and I'm sure we'll find out in the comment section what really happened. <laughs> because the dude is uh, the the Chris Ryan pseudonym guy. He's still doing podcasts, so I'm sure he talks about it. But I hope to God that that dude's not dissing his fucking teammate. Because if you know, I got some fallen brothers, and I would never talk shit about them, and I don't I don't give a fuck if it if it was their fault. Like keep that shit to yourself. Yeah, mistakes happen, war happens, and stupid shit happens all the time. Like. Stupid shit. I could t- I could look at everyone on my team after a combat like a uh, uh, like kinetic combat operation, mm-hmm. and I could point at every one of them and be like, "You did some dumb shit." Every one of us did, but we all did some brave shit too. Yeah. And this guy, it shows it that he did a ton of brave shit, and there's no reason you should be like fucking. It's your fault. Like, <laughs> it's the fucking guy's fault that sent us on this stupid ass mission with no fucking equipment and a terrible ass plan. So I just thought that was interesting. So he has his he has his compass taped to his rifle. Mm. And it's like that's clever, I guess, because you're always gonna have your rifle, so to have a compass, but we were always taught like to keep your compass away from metal because it could mess up your true north. You mess up your north. Cause it's a I mean it's it's magnetic, right? Well, just logic would tell me to keep it separate just for the fact that if I lose one, I still have the other. If I lose one thing, I don't have to lose both. I mean, that's a good point, too. That's the only that's the only logic that would come up in my brain. Obviously, I have no clue. But we always try to keep our compasses away from metal because we're afraid that the metal could pull off north. Mm. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's just a really clever thing to do to tape a compass to your rifle. I don't know. A lot of times we try to, like, we have a lot of, bush ingenuity right going on i just thought it was an interesting thing but then this is the thing so they're moving out and then now we'll see once they start coming under attack and it gets it gets insane yeah it's funny that you see all the stuff in these different movies especially the ones that are based on true stories where it's like all these different tactics that get used and it's just basically your word against his. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, everybody's going to look at that and say, oh, no, that's not the way you do it. When at the end of the day, it's just the way that guy did it when he was on that mission specifically. It's not the way everybody's supposed to do it. But then you have a way of doing it. But then everybody else that is not involved with that stuff at all, like me, would look at it and be like, oh, well, that's right or wrong based on what you heard. Yep. It's just weird how that goes. And that's it's so right because at the end of the day, when we watch these movies as other special operations watching somebody, mm-hmm. you'd be like, I wouldn't have done it that way. But that doesn't make it right. Yeah. And is and you there's no one way to do anything. He's in that situation. He knows what's going on. He's the boots on the ground. He knows the right fucking thing to do or the wrong thing to do. And regardless, he made that decision and he's a smart person right. because otherwise he wouldn't have been in in that position. Right. So it's like we could always judge other people and, and like armchair quarterback it, but at the end of the day like we're just guessing. We're just taking what with the information that we have at the time and we're making the best decision we can at that moment whether it's right or wrong i mean that's only going to find out in the future when you look back and evaluate what actually happened So this this scene, it's probably just Hollywood that makes it look unrealistic, but it looks ridiculous because it's like you have these guys wide open just laying on the floor mm-hmm. with all 5.56. Five, they all have M4s or 249s, so they're all 5.56, five, so small arms. Mm-hmm. And then you got guys with tanks, you got guys with AK-47s, you got guys with 50 cals, and they're losing to these this one group of guys wide open. Like, literally, all that dude had to do with that 50 cal is just, he's going, like, single shot, pow, pow, and then all of a sudden, he's, like, 50 cal's dead because he got hit. All that guy has to do is hang low and just run that 50 cal over that whole line of dudes. And they're fucking done. Like, they don't have any cover in front of them or anything. They have no cover. They have no cover. They have no concealment. They have nothing. It's, like, worst-case scenario. 
and they're going against tanks and 50 cals. And somehow they use 5.56 five, to shoot their way out of that? Either, if this is real, guys, I'm not saying this isn't real, but if this is how it went down, these motherfuckers have the hand of Jesus <laughs> just like over top of them. Like God was like, not today, boys. And they're just that talented. And I'm not saying they're not, but gosh damn, if this is accurate, these dudes should have went and played the fucking lottery as soon as they got the survivors as soon as they got home. Because this shit is insane. Insane. Do you want the medicate? No. Well, save me flask. Right. One of us takes around, we'll be glad of a quick nip. You okay? Yeah. My legs buckled. You're telling me that 209 pounds and all of you guys didn't have your own med kit? There was only <laughs> one med kit? You had one med kit for all of you? Fuck you put in that bag. What did you have in that bag? That 200 pounds of shit. When I was in Afghanistan, I had, and this is again, this is far before we went to war, so we had a lot of lessons learned, and we could have made these adjustments because of these guys, mm -hmm. right? So they went ahead of us, made some mistakes, and they probably saved countless lives from the mistakes that they made because their lessons learned that we didn't have to make later on, mm -hmm. right? There's mistakes we didn't have to make. But fast forward to, you know, 2013, 2015, everyone's got a, a med kit. All right, so I would have a med kit underneath my plates and then I would just be able to pull it out and then I had everything I needed and I used it. My, my Terp got shot and I got him back and I had to cover fire. He got back into the uh, Mat V and then I pulled my med kit out and I wrapped his bullet hole with it. Mm -hmm. And then I missed the exit wound, so then I had to borrow a med kit from my buddy and then get the exit wound. But we all have med kits, and it's such a small, you know, piece once you flatten it out and you could you could suction it flat mm. and fit it up there, like or you have it on your belt. But it, it's just crazy to me that they were like, "Do you have the med kit?" Like, nah, they got shot, or I had to leave it behind because I, we missed this this part, but they left all their rucksacks. Oh, okay. Because they were too heavy. Oh, well, that makes sense. Yeah. So they were like, we can't move fast enough, so we had to drop all their gear. This meant we lived sign the moment we moved off. But this was the least of our worries. Mark was down with hypothermia. Yeah, hypothermia in the desert. He's a mate. All right, so I don't know how many, it's either two or three guys died from hypothermia. Which is bizarre because they're in the middle of the fucking desert. He said that his the biggest enemy was the weather. It was the cold that fucked them mm. the hardest. Because I guess they were moving out and they had to get across the border. And they would have made it just fine if it wasn't for this like freezing weather that came in. And they just didn't have the snivel gear. They, they weren't prepared for freezing weather. Mm. So they lost multiple guys to hypothermia. Um, which... Him saying that the biggest enemy was the weather, but then watching this movie is like, okay, there's obviously some contradiction there because it's like the biggest enemy was the weather, which makes sense. I, I totally believe that. But then you're up against unbelievable odds in these gunfights. Mm -hmm. So it, I think he kind of clued us into what was really going on is that the, the gunfights may have been exaggerated and the real danger just came down to, which is an, an amazing story in, a, in of itself, is how many miles they had to walk and the, the weather they had to deal with just to get to safety mm -hmm. was insane. But so I think he was kind of cluing us in there that this was the, the shooting and all the, the kinetic part was kind of hyperinflated. Mm -hmm. Israeli, British, doesn't matter much to me for now. However, both countries would not send men who know jack shit into their enemy's territory. All right, pause it. In Seer School, we ate out of the same fucking silver <laughs> bowls. In the same exact bowls we ate out of, out of Seer School. We ate rice out of them. So it's crazy because, like, Seer School is exactly like this. Like, this part is super accurate. 
when he's like, have you eaten? It's like, the fuck? Are you cadre? Like, they fucking, <laughs> are you hungry? Have you eaten? No, I'm so hungry. Uh, and my teammates, they're also really hungry. It's like Sears School 101. Mm. Like, that's exactly what we're trying to do in Sears School. And then they make us eat out of those fucking bowls. And the whole point is that they're, you're supposed to feel degraded. Yeah. You awesome. know, and, and obviously, like, they're going to make you eat off the out of dog bowls off the ground. It's Sear 101. So that shit is, like, brought me back because he, he's like, no, I'm so hungry. I can't think right now. I'm confused. That's it's exactly what they teach you in tier school. Is to fake the hunger, fake the confusion. I can't think. I'm so tired. I'm so hungry. I can't even lift my arms. You're you're just like you're you're faking. Mm-hmm. So that way they think that you're such a useless piece of shit, like not capable of anything. Like that they almost have pity on you. Mm. And then so that way they don't expect that you are keeping your shit together and you're actually trying to figure out how to escape and how to get out. So it's a ploy to just pretend to be the most useless, worthless piece of garbage on the planet. Um, So I thought he hit that fucking... And then to have him eat out of the dog bowls that we use, I thought that was pretty funny. All right, guys. So there it was. Bravo 2-0. I wish that it was a funner movie to watch. Uh, part of it's that it was made in 1999. Part of it is that the the movie just wasn't made very well. But the story is insane, and I still stand by the fact that I I hope I I don't I wish I hope that they make it again. I hope that they remake this movie. I would if it was up to me, they would get all the survivors together and have them all say this is what happened, and when they all agree. On what happened, they remake that movie with just exactly what happened and how it went down, and it would be sick. But they just didn't do him justice in this movie, which is crazy because the main actor is the dude that we, our beloved actor from Game of Thrones, who gets his head chopped off. <laughs> and it's so sad. Stark, what is it? Not in Stark. Uh, Ned? What's his name from Game of Thrones? I didn't really watch that. You didn't watch Game of Thrones? I watched like a couple episodes and I wasn't into it. Pam cried when he got killed. Sean Bean. Because he was like the fucking baddest character and then they just lopped his head off. It was terrible. I think he's a great actor. He is. He is. But, anywho, there it is. Bravo 2-0. I, like, like yeah, it's hard. It's hard. This is why we don't like reviewing actual events. Yeah. Because it's like, on one hand, you're, you're talking shit about a movie and you're like, ah, this doesn't seem realistic. But on the other hand, you got to remember that there's real heroes involved here. Mm-hmm. And they really did some amazing stuff. I just wish they were more transparent. So when you watch it, you're like, that fucking happened. I know it happened because it makes sense. But when you watch this movie, you're like, bye. See you guys in the next one. <laughs> I don't buy it. Did you, even the scenes, 